sponsors, the Stewart Family Foundation and Worldwide Technology. We'd like to remind you of our listening room policy and ask that you please keep table conversation to a minimum during the performance and silence your phone out of respect to those around you and the musicians on stage. The use of flash photography is prohibited, as is the use of any recording equipment. On behalf of Jazz St. Louis and our restaurant partner, Birch Culinary Company, we sincerely hope you enjoy tonight's performance. All right, good evening, everyone. I think we can do better than that. We're here for a free night of music. Good evening, everyone. How are we feeling? All right. My name is Andy Amen. I am the Director of Education and Community Engagement, and I'm here to introduce this wonderful program tonight. Uh, before I do so, I want to take just a moment and thank our gracious sponsors who keep this program, our Whitaker Jazz Speak series, free for all of you. Uh, we got to thank the M Missouri Humanities and our friends at the Whitaker Foundation, so let's give them a big round of applause. As I mentioned, this is one of four Whitaker Jazz Speaks events we have throughout the year, so I hope you will come back and join us again. Uh, our next one on December 6th is entitled Nelson on Nelson, and we'll feature Oliver Nelson Jr. speaking about his father, and we'll be performing uh, some of the music from Oliver Nelson's Blues and the Abstract Truth. And uh, Oliver Nelson Jr. just told me that he's got some new charts that have not been played in more than 50 years, not new charts, old charts that have not been played in more than 50 years. So don't miss that, it'll be a really exciting event. But tonight, we have a really special treat for you all. Um, this is really, we're really happy to bring to the stage tonight um, as a special last minute fill-in for this event, uh, our brand new president and CEO. So please put your hands together and welcome Victor Goins.
Thank you all so much for coming out. Welcome to Jazz St. Louis. You've got my name, I'm Victor Goins. At the piano, Zach Radwine. Yeah. At the bass, Bob DeBoo. And on the drums, Marty Morrison. It's a pleasure to be here to uh, talk to you about how jazz speaks and how it has spoken through, throughout the history of the music. I picked a couple of artists to talk about. We're gonna give it a shot. Our opening composition was a spiritual entitled Wade in the Water because we've been using that music for so long in jazz, it just made perfect sense. I selected it because it's a composition that's created by African Americans and related to slavery and a demonstration of how jazz musicians can actually speak through that music. In this arrangement, hopefully you heard from the drums. You heard the drums speaking to you from the very beginning, from a distance, and how important that instrument has been to Africa and African American musicians. It immediately spoke to me, which is why we started with that particular instrument. Tonight, as I mentioned, I have selected some songs that were composed by jazz legends that address the issues of tragedy and social inequality in America during the time. Our format for the evening is going to be slightly different than usual. Usually you have like 45 minutes of lecture, then 45 minutes of music. Well, we're going to play, we're going to talk, we're going to play, we're going to talk. And then at the end of it all, we'll do some Q&A if we have some time remaining. You can ask some questions. You know, jazz musicians like to speak to people if you haven't heard about that. <laughs> we try to give our good answers. We're not always um, as good as we like to be, but it's a learning experience. So if you can imagine that the year is 1963, the city is Birmingham, and the place is the 16th, 16th Street Baptist Church. The period is known as the Civil Rights Movement. It was one of the deadliest acts of violence to take place during the time, and it evoked criticism and outrage from around the world. On sep September 15, 1963, as the congregation of that particular church prepared for its annual youth celebration, a bomb exploded in the stairwell, killing four young African-American girls and injuring dozens of others. In the aftermath, riots and violent demonstrations broke out throughout Birmingham. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, which previously served as a central meeting place and staging ground for the civil rights activities, was intended to stall the, progress, the progression of the civil rights movement. However, the tragedy had the opposite effect, galvanizing support and propelling the movement forward. On November 18th of that same year, John Coltrane took his quartet into the studio to record a musical composition as a memorial to the four victims. I read an article where the writer stated, it might seem the instrumental music lacking words would not be the most effective medium for a statement of outrage. However, John Coltrane's message was significant and highly effective. It came through loud and clear. The sorrow, sadness, and deep distress of his tenor saxophone voice shouts from the mountaintop in his spiritual composition entitled Alabama. In his recording can be heard the cries and seamless, senseless loss associated with the unthinkable act. Each note is an emotional experience. This is John Coltrane's Alabama.
Thank you very much. Charles Mingus, he thought of his performances as jazz workshops. And he was a staunch advocate of spontaneity. While he was one of the true geniuses of jazz composition, he always taught his music by rote. He was not opposed to teaching on the bandstand publicly, or embarrassing you for that matter. His music captures the sophistication of the music and the musician and the down-home feeling of the people. Some of his titles were significant, Better Get Hit In Your Soul, or The Hold Down is another one. He wasn't a shy guy. You should check out his autobiography, Beneath the Underdog. It should have like a, a sensor, like triple X rated or something like that on it. <laughs> it's a must read, but I wouldn't give it to your 12 year old. And he spoke unabashedly through his music. The Fables of Fabus has been considered one of his most explicitly political works. It was written as a direct protest against Arkansas Governor Orville Fabus and his 1957 decision to send out the National Guard to prevent racial integration of Little Rock Central High School by the nine African American teenagers. We know this particular incident as, Little, as the Little Rock Crisis and we know the brave nine students as the Little Rock Nine. It was 1959 when the instrumental version of this piece that we're going to play for you was released on Mingus Our Own. It was instrumental because Columbia Records refused to allow the lyrics on the recording. It was originally recorded as an instrumental, but in 1960 it was recorded again by the independent record label Candide, and released on a recording entitled Charles Mingus Presents Charles Mingus. That's what he thought of himself. <laughs> because of the contractual reasons with Columbia Records, the name of the song was changed from the Fabus of Fabus to the original Fabus of Fabus. Mingus's lyrics truly spoke to his feelings in, in protest of the racial injustice of the time. Here's an example of those lyrics been so long I have to turn the page but I'm not going to read them all for you he starts out with if I was if I was very courageous I would sing them but I'm not that courageous and I also don't want to clear the room <laughs> but it says oh Lord don't let them shoot us oh Lord don't let them stab us oh Lord don't let them shoot us oh Lord don't let them stab us oh Lord no more swat swaticus oh Lord don't let them tar and feather us he said, oh Lord, no more Ku Klux Klan. Name me someone who's ridiculous. Then he calls out to his, his drummer, Danny, or his trumpet to Danny, he said, and they say, Governor Farbus, why is he so sick and ridiculous? He won't permit integrated schools. Then he's a fool. And he goes on and on in that particular way. You should check out the recording of him singing it. It's much more dynamic and um, interesting to me, reading them out loud to you. But I want you to check out how he speaks to the audience and to the musicians as we give our rendition of the fables of Phobos for you. There's a part where it kind of sounds circus-like, if not comical, because the whole idea that a governor would prohibit students from integrating at that time was just totally absurd. So that's the part, in my interpretation, that's Governor Phobos. And then the sophisticated part is the Little, Little Rock Nine. So when you hear the swing, like for instance, let's just play a little bit of um, the beginning for them. Um, beginning to letter A. You're gonna play the melody for me? Okay, here we go. One, in fact, I'll just, I'll sing the beginning of it. I'm not gonna go into the lyrics. Okay, here we go. Let me pull this up. At the top of the piece. One, two, three. part comes in when we um, let it be. 
Now, the reason why I call that the sophisticated part is because for us as jazz musicians on the bandstand, we're all about collaboration. We're about integration. We're about coming together. Everything that we do up here is about oneness. So the idea of being separated and, and, and segregated is not what jazz is about. That's not how jazz speaks. So we're going to play for you now Fables of Faubus, give you our rendition of it, and then you can go home and check it out tonight, and you can start reading Beneath the Underdog. Thank you. 
Charles Mangus, The Fables of Fabulous. All right. The next person is one of my all-time favorites and really a gentleman who influenced me on the tenor saxophone, the great Theodore Sonny Rollins. And um, in 1958, Sonny Rollins recorded for Riverside Records a piece entitled The Freedom Suite. I often wonder what was the motivation for this recording? Was it because Sonny's notes, you know, um, why did he do this piece? Some people say that he was actually attempting to get a, an apartment in New York City, and they actually declined him the opportunity to get that apartment because of his race. So the original record was going by the title of the Freedom Suite. However, the record company thought it was too controversial because it showed Sonny Rollins with a picture from the middle of his chest upward without a shirt on, sort of like depicting slavery. And um, he also had some liner notes on there that he wrote a note about that said, America is deeply rooted in Negro culture. It's colloquialisms, it's humors, it's music. How ironic that the Negro, who more than any other people can claim America's culture as his own, is being per persecuted and repressed, that the Negro who has exemplified the humanities in, er in his very existence is being rewarded with inhumanity. That was definitely a statement for the time. So, um, and it still is, it is. Well, you better believe that that writing didn't last very long, <laughs> nor did the record. They pulled the record, immediately reached, they, weren't, they were not going to ignore releasing Sonny's record, they just wasn't gonna put it under that title. So the new title came out as The Shadow Waltz, and they pulled the picture, and they had another picture. Riverside Records initially deemed the piece and its intentions to be too provocative and controversial and attempted to change the content. Some thought that Riverside Records thought America wanted to hear the black music, but not the black story and that this is exactly the mentality the civil rights movements aim to overturn and the fight that, freedom, that the Freedom Suite aimed to express. Sonny thought the Freedom Suite represented the change that would, come, what, that would soon come and the freedom that the African American population was battling for nationwide. As a musician, Sonny Rollins' voice speaks to, the, to total freedom, freedom of harmonic, rhythmic, and melodic limitations. He is what I consider to be one of the greatest musicians of all time. He's still alive to this day, too. I had the pleasure of meeting him back in 1984 for all of our people who remember that year. It's been a time. But he was quite the gentleman then, and I met him once again um, at Carnegie Hall at a concert with Branford Marcellus. And they were both on the same stage, and Sonny Rollins showed him why he was Sonny Rollins and why he was Branford Marcellus. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great concert, I must admit, you know. <laughs> All of us were backstage, like, every time Sonny would play something, we were like, ooh, ooh, oh, oh. <laughs> but it was fantastic. So, Branford, if you're watching this, forgive me. I love you. You know I love you, He's my brother. But uh, Sonny was Sonny. So, um, in a closing liner note that I read of a two 2009 article in a magazine called Musicology about the Freedom Suite writer, I think he pronounces his name, Inetan Marcel. Of course, it's a European thing. We don't write about these kind of things in America. But he said, we may hope that such short-sighted censorship is now dead in the USA, which has just elected, since we have just elected the first African-American president. Well, we know that has not been the case since Barack Obama has become president and since he has gone. But we do hope that there is still a, an opportunity for a change to take place, and we hope that we will overcome that as well. So this piece, The Freedom Suite of Sonny's, is very unique in that it's a 20-minute first take on the record, which is usually musicians record songs one track at a time. But Sonny did the whole thing straight through. And um, it's in four movements. He had very creative titles, one, two, three, and four. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're going to play the second movement for you now. And this is the ballad of it. I mean, I could have. 
we could have played something that was fast, but I thought the beauty of Sonny is also his ability to play fantastic melodies. So um, this is the Freedom Suite Movement 2 by Sonny Rollins. We hope you enjoy.
Thank you very much. Now we have a little bit more, but I think this is a good time to talk. <laughs> After a good ballot, yay, you know, hey. So if we have any questions out there? I mean, you know, we don't have to be strangers. We're all friends. Any questions, don't be shy. This is the time you've been waiting for all your life. Like, what are they thinking about up there? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Just yell it out. Yes, ma'am. Uh-oh. We take personal questions, we just don't always answer them. Uh, has anybody ever told, you mentioned the Marsalis earlier, has anybody ever told you that you sound like him? Uh, you sound just like Winston. Are you related? I'm older than him, so he sounds like me. <laughs> We're brothers, yes we are. I've, I've been playing with him for 29 years. I've known him since we went to kindergarten. His father was one of my best friends and my teachers. You're bound to pick up something. I hope I picked up some of his better traits too. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Other questions? Again, we're all friends up in this is Jazz St. Louis. You know, when they, I took the job, they said, man, we're all friends here. Come over here, you're gonna have a good time. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. What was, what was the inspiration for doing for Jazz for Justice at this time, you say it too, as opposed to some other time, potentially? Well, you know, as a musician, jazz speaks to us in all different types of ways. So I didn't just want to talk about the simplicity of playing on chord changes or form or things like that. Sometimes you got to talk about some of the difficult things. And, and, and for me, I, I decided to go into that particular direction because it was also a time for me to learn because I had to do some homework. You know, I'm not a historian, I'm a, I'm a saxophone player. Those two things are different. And, and when historians come to the bandstand, we try to tell them, you know, this is not like reading a book. This is different on this, this side of the bandstand. But when we go into their world too, we have to come up with some knowledge. So for me at this time, I thought I'd take, I wouldn't pull the low hanging fruit I wanted to reach higher on the tree and learn something new about the music, about myself, about the people that I've actually got, had a chance to meet and that I respect so much. So that's why I went the direction of going to the social justice and how all of these freedom things meant to them and how they express it through their music and how we need to know about it so that we can continue to work on these problems that we have in, in St. Louis and New Orleans and America. We got a lot of problems. We got a lot of great things too. You know, we got to look at our good things and work on our worst things. That was my rationale. Thank you for that question. Okay. Okay, from the things I have learned in my research, what has been the most interesting or surprising things? Now, you've already hit on my last song now. So I'm not gonna play it quite yet, but I'll tell you what it is. You know, um, I've taught for 40 years, so I've been fortunate to be able to, to know, and I think some of my greatest teachers have been my students. If you think you know something, go teach it. Who you are really educated about what you think you know. I don't have kids, so it, you know, parenting is a whole nother teaching experience. And uh, in fact, I'll tell you real quick and get back to your thing. It's a buddy of mine who's a, who's a, he, he's a retired pilot and when he had his first kid and they got relieved the hospital, you know, it's the doctor, so you can go home now. He said, but you're not gonna give me a user manual? You could just let me take this home with me? <laughs> you talk about on the job training, they call that raising kids. So, but anyway, the most interesting thing is um, one of my good friends and former students is Nicholas Payton, a great trumpet player. And Nicholas is quite verbal on social media about a lot of things, some I agree with some of them I don't. But he has led uh, a movement to talk about music and renaming it, not jazz, but black music. Now, I think the music is for everybody, myself. We can talk about who created it and we can come up with some concrete facts about it. Even historically, there's some people who debate about it and that's another lecture at another time. We can get into that. But when I studied Max Roach, and I, I met Max Roach a couple of times, I didn't realize 
that at a point in time, he dismissed the term jazz and called his music black music. He said, because he didn't want, now I'm telling you my script, I'm gonna have to just play the song and not talk about it. <laughs> but uh, he said that he didn't want an association with the negative connotations associated with the word jazz. So the word jazz from early history suggested sexual connotations. He didn't like the association of it to the, home, the houses of ill repute that took place in New Orleans. And the music that he played, he said was much more dignified than those particular things. So therefore, he, he refused to call this music jazz, even though he was one of the major pioneers in the whole bebop movement and so many other things along the way. So to hear Max Roach talk about that in uh, some of the articles I read, you know, it's, this is not the end of my research. This is only the beginning, because there was a lot of information out there, but only a very little amount of time to, to really resource it and pull it. So um, that was very, very interesting to me and something that I will continue to explore. Now, I call what I play jazz, I'm from New Orleans, I know about the houses of ill repute. A lot that still exists today. But um, those same homes of ill repute were very, very important to jazz music because wherever that was taking place, they had great musicians playing. Stride piano players, they had a piano in every bar, in every home. They had small groups that played up in there. So they, those particular spaces were very important to allow the music to evolve and to, for musicians to be able to make their, their uh, livelihood and raise their families. So there was a lot of negative in it, yeah, but there was a lot of positive in it. So um, research will only continue from this point on. I thank you for your question though. Thank you. Yes, sir, Tom. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh oh. Let me call Katie, our development person. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make it a blanket statement. You ready? Great things. All right? Great things. How about that? Expect great things. But to, in order to see those great things, we're gonna need some regular returns on the house. Now you gotta come back, because you know change doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes a long time. So we're gonna have some change happening, we're gonna have some great things going on, and we hope to, that you're gonna be a part of it, starting with our October 14th event that's taking place called Homecoming. Now, I regret to inform you that we're sold out. <laughs> that's a great problem, you know, but we do have some VI, okay, do you in the house? We have some VIP stuff happening, right? So if you have two other friends, you could be V, that could be I and P. Y'all could come together and we could get a package together that could work out for them, don't you think? Okay, there you go. That's the kind of things you can expect from Jazz St. Louis, new ideas. We're gonna be creative. We're gonna figure out how to make it happen. No more what we can do, what can we do? Yes, ma'am. All right. I do have a question about um, Manus, um, who you were playing before. And you talked about the sophisticated parts of the song and then the silly parts is what I, 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 I that's yes. the song, but there were like two other spaces other than that first section that seemed kind of disjointed and kind of like wild and crazy. And you didn't talk about those when we heard them as a good thing. Well, you know, if, if, if you read that book, Charles Mangus, you go see why those pieces were like they were. He was very, very, Thank you. Colorful. <laughs> you know, he had a very diverse type of personality. Um, you know, he would change moods in a heartbeat. It wasn't beyond him. But then he would write some of the most beautiful things in the world, like a piece called Duke Ellington's Song of Love. He was influenced by Duke Ellington. But at the same time, Duke uh, Mingus, that is Charles Mingus, was able to Winton and I talked about this. I think Charles Mangus was able to take the New Orleans tradition and incorporate it in his music at a higher level than any other musician. Because the New Orleans tradition is one of improvisatory music with three horns, a clarinet, trumpet, and, and trombone on the front, and the rhythm section behind it. And we're in constant improvisation. 
And that's what Charles Mangus was about, constant improvisation. So I didn't speak specifically about the other ones, and that was very observant of you to realize there were a lot of personalities in the music. I mean, truly uh, observant, and that means you were listening. That's a very important thing in jazz and in, in humanity as well. We have to learn to be better listeners. And if we be better listeners, we'll all be better people. So keep checking out. Check out some Mangus, though, on your own. You're going to say, oh, that's what that was. I get it now. All right, but I appreciate that. And I'm going to come down to the Blues Museum and check y'all out. I appreciate you coming out tonight. You know, there's only 24 hours in a day, so I've been working on 23 of them every day. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and come in. Yes. Dr. Horn, you said, right? Yes. yes. You know, I don't know all the details. I know what I know. And I know the pandemic has changed how many of us function. And for him, I think he was just not ready to be out quite yet in, in the general public. Um, I have friends who have, they got out too early, and some who are still waiting for the right time. But I think the time is now. And uh, we can just protect ourselves to the level of comfort that we exist in. And um, so he just chose not to come out and be here at this particular time. But we hope we're going to have him back in the future. You know, there, there's, there's going to be times. And I hope he, I look forward to meeting him. I, I definitely bought his book and started reading it. Yes, ma'am, it is. Quite, quite informative. Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, what, what caused Dr. Horn to cancel? And I said, I didn't really know the details of it, but I know part of it, he just wasn't ready to come out and, and be out in this particular type of environment as a result of the pandemic. You know, it could be, I don't want to speculate on why. I mean, we, we don't know. You know, it could be personal for whatever reason. It could be somebody in his household that like he don't want to expose to bring something home. We all have versions of that that we deal with. So that was the question. Sir, yes. Okay, you taking notes, Katie? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to tell you some. Collaboration is high on my list because in my time at Jazz and Lincoln Center, we've done collaborations of all types. We've done collaborations. You talked about art. You know, there's a there's a interconnectivity between jazz and art, and and we have rhythm in art. We have form. We have dissonance. We have free form. You know, I'm still trying to figure out Jackson Pollock. That's free form by at its best. You know. But at the same time, there's something for everybody. So the key is that we all have to have something. In fact, um, what is available to the general public is an auction we have. Katie, can you scream it out from up there? So, okay, so go to homecoming website on JS St. Louis's. Okay, so that's gonna be, and he's gonna be painting it at the time, right? Okay, so there's an example of what we're talking about. You know, and um, if you want some original artwork that you can be able to display for throughout your life and pass on to your heirs, we encourage you to go ahead and get, up, get in that auction. Raise the bidding, we need the money. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I, I do plan on coming there. I, I'm here, I bought a house there, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, right there. I just got a, a musical question. Like, what is the distinction between jazz and blues? What's the distinction between jazz and blues? Well, the short answer. How about that? And this is my, in my opinion, not just validated it, for me anyway. The next person can come along with a completely different thing and they justify it. If they justify it to your liking, then that's an acceptable answer. In my opinion, blues exists inside of jazz. 
Jazz don't exist inside of blues. Whenever we play, we have the blues inside of what we play, and not just the form, but the feeling. There was a great pianist by the name of John Lewis, who was the musical director of the Modern Jazz Quartet for 50 years. And I had to, I don't, I don't even know what to call it, just a ridiculous pleasure of knowing Mr. Lewis personally. And in 2001, I started a jazz studies program at the Juilliard School. And so one of the people I wanted to talk to about that was John Lewis. So I went to his home. And we spent the day together, and I had a bunch of questions for him, and he answered all of them. And the last question I asked him was, what is jazz to him? So he said, in order for something to be jazz, it has to have three elements. It has to have the suggestion of swing. That doesn't mean you always have to play this, play ting, shake, and ing, shake, and ing for me. Play that. OK, that's the fundamental swing rhythm in jazz. But also, it can have an Afro-Cuban 6-8. Can you play me? OK, good. Now, both of those are still swinging. Or it can have a bossa nova groove. Play, uh, you know the girl from Ipanema? OK, play the girl from Ipanema, just the, the A sections. One, two, So even though that's out of the thank you, even though that's out of the Brazilian tradition, all of those have kind of swinging grooves to them and claves and things that are utilized inside of jazz music. But the blues, all of them also have the feeling of the blues in it. So the blues doesn't have to be said, by the way. I used to play with Ruth Brown. I know what the blues is. The first gig I played with, I came out playing bebop. She stopped the band. She said, "Baby, this is a rhythm and blues band." Can you play less rhythm and more blues? <laughs> it was a rude awakening. It was an education in every way, and I loved her. So, but the blues is like a vaccine. It's like the COVID vaccine, only healthy, but it's a blues. And meaning that when you get the blues, you play the blues to get rid of the blues. When we got COVID, we created a vaccine with COVID to get rid of COVID. So that's kind of like the blues. That's what the blues is about. So the blues is a part of jazz, of what's taking place. But in terms of, now, we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna just time out from here because it can get long. But we can go a lot of different ways in blues, you know, whether we're talking about Mississippi blues, or Deep South, or we can go wherever you wanna go. There's a lot of different blueses. The way people, St. Louis blues, W.C. Handy, yes. So there's a lot of it, but that's the simple answer for it, okay? All right, other questions? I'm going to go here. Well, you said everything. I don't need to say it against you. <laughs> she was treated unfairly because of her race and her gender. You know, and, you know, she lived at a time when, and guess what? That time has not expired. You know, the, the, the suffrage movement was in the 1920s, and here we are in the 2020s, and we're still in the second suffrage movement. And women are still fighting to have equal rights. So, you know, um, she was a part of that. Now, I know a little bit about that because my PhD study is on the inequities that women have dealt with. So now, if we do some research about homework, we might be lucky enough not to make the same mistakes twice. And that would be a great thing. That way we could utilize our time. Okay, but she was you know, a victim of the times and what women had to go through. But I would like to believe that we're not in that time period anymore. I'm not foolish enough to buy into it completely, but hopefully we can actually be proactive in trying to make this a better place for women to be able to participate and be involved in. And with all due respect, so they don't have to only be the piano player and the singer. 
so they could be the guitar player and the, and the horn player and the bass player and the drummer, you know? So there's a lot of great ones out there. Matter of fact, um, Tia Fuller's going to be here when? Can anybody from Jazz St. Louis tell me? End of the month? Two weeks. And if you weren't lucky enough, you just missed Regina Carter. If you weren't here, ooh, you should have been here. You missed it. She's going to be here? She was here? Okay. I started on September 19. I think she was right before me. But, you know, I look forward to hearing all of those musicians come here and play. You know, so there's a lot of them. So what we can do, though, is come out and support them and, and support young musicians, like you said, who we don't know. You know, it's great. If Herbie comes, I'm sure the lines will go around the block three times. Herbie Hancock I'm talking about. But what if uh, Shelly Hancock comes? Let's come check her out, you know. <laughs> Let's make the lines go around the block for that, too, and check out some younger musicians supported. That way the music can live on as opposed to just stopping when those people leave. You know, we've lost a lot of great musicians, but we'd like for that legacy to be continued. Okay? No, I'm going to get off my, my preacher there. They had another question somewhere around. Yes. Well, you know, the, the question was, can I speak to the artists about the artists today who were here trying to keep the music alive? It's a great question. And for all that I do know, I feel like I fall short because they're all that I don't know who are keeping the music alive. You know, everybody knows who John Coltrane was. <laughs> we just, our general manager is working on it. We're going to give him a moment. But if you see me go that way, come with me. We okay, Tom? Yeah, there's no fire. Keep them warm. There's not too much heat. Okay. okay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now I want y'all to know, y'all go back. You can go back home and say, man, there was some heat in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> if this saxophone don't work, I'm going to work on some stand-up comedy. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> to your point, you know, I know all of the usuals of Kenny Garrett being out there and, um, you know, Etienne Charles, who was a student of mine who's going to be here, Sean Jones, I, I mentioned Herbie, Terrence Blanchard, Winton, Harry Connor Jr., Brandon Marcellus, Jeff Watts. You know, you can, you can do a roll call of all those people, and then you will still be extremely short of all of the musicians who are out here keeping it alive. So we are responsible with the task of going out to find those other people who are not at the tip of our tongues. It's just like the gentleman said about the art. We, we are responsible to go out and check it out and not expect somebody to always tell us the names we go, she go check out. Because then when you go check them out, you might like something I don't like. As a friend of mine said, what you love might kill me. You know, so you, I think we all have to check out other people who come in. For instance, tomorrow we have in the house, and I'm, you know, I live like about an hour, so I don't always know. Bob, I see you there. Who's in the house tomorrow night? Okay, Jamal Nichols is here. That's St. Louis' own. Scooter Brown, Antonio Foster, Emmanuel Harrell. Okay. Now, if we really want to make this happen, and we have how many seats in the house? Two or eight? Okay, we could make two people stand in the back. But <laughs> <laughs> let's get 208 people up here, and then we'll be making St. Louis, Jazz St. Louis, the place you want it to be, because this is your Jazz St. Louis. So y'all have to make it the place y'all want it to be to be so y'all don't have to go to New York to check out Jazz at Lincoln Center. Yeah. We're here. All right. Other questions? How we doing on time? Let's go ahead, question. We, oh, you will? Will I do the book club? Oh, man. My reading is not at a speed level that I can do book clubs every week. But uh, I, I would look forward to attending a book club. How about that? But uh, there's, there's some great people doing it, and uh, we'll see. We'll see. It's got to be a book that I really feel comfortable with. All right, other questions? 
Well, I told you Sonny Rollins was one of them, right? You know, I grew up with Branford. And it's very rare that a person who is your age, one year older than you, is a person who inspired you. So he inspired me. And he still inspired me. Um, Ellis Marcellus, I loved him. That was my teacher, but he was, I was closer to him than I was with Branford. So uh, that was a great loss to all of us, you know. So those, those are the ones who impacted me the most. But um, like I told you, Sonny Rollins and John Coltrane as a saxophonist were the two that I went after the hardest in my younger study. And then as I got older and understood the need to understand the history of all of it, I went back and checked all of them out. Coleman Hawkins, Leslie Young, Chewberry, Don Bias, and you can do a whole roll call and we'll still be up in here a little while. There's a lot. Okay, yes, ma'am. What did you Well, that's a great question. What do I tend to do with the legacy of Miles Davis? I know his, his, his I think his nephew Vince, mm -hmm. for one. You know, and actually I wrote a piece for Cecily Tyson when she passed. That's another long story because she's buried at Woodlawn Cemetery in New York. Uh, across the street from Miles Davis, next to my plot in Woodlawn Cemetery, across the street from Miles in Duke Ellington. But I don't plan to use my space too often. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I expect to first of all go over there and become familiar with it. Because I don't, I don't know as much about it as I need to know. And then as I... But I can tell you, when I first considered the position, I, I, I said Miles' role need to be more present. Then I did some homework, and guess what? So, so should Clark Terry's. Mm -hmm. And I knew Mr. Terry very well. I, I, I played his memorial sir. I played his funeral, actually. And I, we played for him in the hospital in Pine Bluff before he died. So there's a lot of legacy here, you know, and people space on Velma Middleton, who played with Louis Armstrong. Most people don't know about her. Uh, there's a lot to be, to be done in St. Louis. St. Louis got a lot. Now, y'all can't be spacing on your hometown. Y'all got to bring it out. You know, the problem is when you got a lot on the banquet table, you got to get at it, and you can't just sample a little bit of it. You got to eat deep. And there's a lot of depth up in here y'all have to deal with, and we're going to deal with, I should say. I'm here. Yeah. So, right sir. Okay. Can you write that name down for me, yeah. Katie? Yeah. Okay, now, here's my time now. Now I'm in my time. You're going to appreciate me. We want to do something for all of that, but we need your support. <laughs> we need you to help us help you. We can't do it just on the resources that we have right now. We need everybody to come in and be a part of it and help us in all our fundraising things, attending the club. But guess what? We can't stay open just by our ticket sales. That don't keep the club open. We're not for profit. That means exactly what it sounds like, not for profit. So, but we can do this if we do it together. We're stronger together. And a friend of mine, Herlin Riley, used to always say, it's hard by the yard, but it's a cinch by the inch. So we'll take our time. We, we'll get to all that. But I'm going to look that name up, sir, and do my homework on it. Thank you for sharing it with me. Other questions? Better outside than inside. <laughs> okay, okay. One more back here. Oh, yes. What plan do you have for the younger generation, the high school? What plan do we have? You know, jazz players. What plans do we have for the high schools and those, who's, who, those who are really kind of becoming of age, going into the next level, right? Yeah. Well, we have education programs for that. Andy, is, where you at, Andy? He's somewhere in the house. Okay, but Andy is our director of education. You saw that he can be much more in-depth in telling you about him. I'm, I'm still kind of new, so I'm learning more about him every day. But I, I came to visit here before I was here with Jazz on Lincoln Center, and we did some things with high school programs. Education is a very important part of what takes place at Jazz St. Louis. 
Now, I will tell you this. High school is rather late in the arts to reach students because by then, you know, it's hard to be great at 20 when you start at 17. But I also say it, it's hard. It's not impossible. You know, it, it can happen. In fact, I'd rather use the word it's challenging to be because James Moody once told me there's no such thing as difficult and easy, only familiar and unfamiliar. So if you go at it from that point of view. But I think we need to get back a little bit, try to figure out how we can get music funded in public schools again. I think when you're riding in your cars, don't let it just be on one type of music. You know, uh, I had to, my oldest sister, I once had to tell her, hey, can you change that and put it on something else for, for my niece? Because I don't want her listening to that. You know, so she can get another exposure to some type of music, you know. It's funny, I've spent 53 years in the music industry. And um, 40 of them have, well, really about 48 of it has been in jazz. So, and I still have some friends back home who still don't come to the concerts and whatever. And sometimes I give them a hard time when they come, they say, hey man, you coming to town, can you give me some tickets? I say, oh no, you have to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> Who's gonna pay for the concert? Somebody's gotta pay for this, this is not free. That's what Ellis Parcellus would always say, somebody's gotta pay for the concert. So somebody does, even my siblings, I, I, my mom, I always get a ticket for. But my siblings, I'd be like, they say, can you give me a ticket? Yeah, I said, "Is." They come one for 12 and two for 24. How many you want? <laughs> so, but I hope I answered your question about the high school kids. We need to get them out, turn them on, send them. Andy, right over there, I think I'm seeing right. We asked about high school programs at Jazz St. Louis. Do we have something that addresses high school kids? Okay. Right, when I came last time with Jalk, right? Right. Uh -huh. So Jacob Melcher, just a little history, is a young man who is from St. Louis. He'll be here for homecoming. He attended the Juilliard School, and he occasionally plays with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra with Wynton Marcellus. So, you know, we have some things here. We need more things, but we need more support so we can have more things, so we can have more things, so we can have more support. We have more support so we can have more things. It goes back and forth. It's a reciprocal kind of thing. All right. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Other questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, they are. They are. You know, one that I know very well is the great Todd Wings. Uh, he played with Wynton Marcellus prior to me, and uh, we played together on a couple of Wynton's pieces. And, um, oh, God, I can't name them all. Who are some of the St. Louisans coming back? Katie, you know? Jason Melser. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Who's the bass player? That's okay. Yeah. Okay. February. Okay. So yeah, but there's a lot of St. Louis in coming back. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I appreciate you. Yeah. Well, he's still one of the geniuses. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Bob Bennett, we got to get this lady on our staff. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, you know, the, the other thing is, yeah, Keon is here, but Keon needs your help too. And, you know, he can't do it alone. I mean, come and, come and support him, but also come support a lot of different young artists who are trying to find their way. And um, because it could be really difficult when you come into a house and play and then you don't see every, you don't see most of the chairs filled. We even, and we run into that as seasoned musicians of 40 years. We come into a place and be like, 
man, don't throw any rocks up. You won't hit anybody. <laughs> you know? So, but it's great to be able to play for people because that's why we do what we do. Okay? All right. So, shall we finish up with Max? Okay, we're going to play a piece. I told you most of my stuff about Max, so there's no sense in going through my script. But this piece was recorded in 1960 off a piece called We Insist, Max Roach's Freedom, Freedom Now Suite. And it's one of his protest records. Originally, this piece was conceived to speak on the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation in, in 1963. It was inspired by the American sit-in movement. If you look at the record cover, you'll see him in a, in a diner, and they're looking over, our, over their shoulders. Um, and African independence movements of the 1950s. We Insist by Max Roach and lyricist Oscar Brown charted an ongoing history of black oppression and freedom struggle. Um, all of the selections on this work speaks to the trials, tribulations, and struggles of African Americans during that time period. And um, the piece we're going to play for you is called Tears for Johannesburg. In African music, rhythm is a very important part of what takes place. In fact, they have what's called a master drummer. Um, and a master drummer is the one who keeps the time. And, and in African music, one person can play a rhythm that never loops. It could be so long that it never comes back to the top of the rhythm. Um, I had the pleasure of collaborating with Jazz and Lincoln Center with a gentleman named Yakub Adi. And his, his ensemble was called Oh Da Da. We did a piece called Congo Square for Jazz and Lincoln Center. Went and wrote this piece. Check it out. It's a great piece. Um, but it talks about African rhythm and all of the things that takes place in it. The 5-4 rhythm of this selection is a response to the South African Sharpeville Massacre of 1960. The original piece, bless you, is marked by mournful vocals by Abby Lincoln in the crying horns, building in percussive anger and moving intense intensity. In an article I read, I discovered that Max Roach, I told you about that, his idea that he would not call his music jazz anymore. He calls it black music for the rest of his life. He rejected the association to the negativisms associated with the etymology of the word jazz. So we're going to play Tears for Johannesburg for you now. We hope you've enjoyed the evening with us. We enjoyed having you here. It was great talking to you all. It exceeded my expectations. I do hope y'all will come back. And, uh, and then after we finish, we can talk some more after we get off this band stand, you know. So uh, thank you all very much. Zach Rywine on the piano. <laughs> Bob DeBoer on the bass. Marty Morrison on the drums. Tears for Johannesburg.
Marty Morrison on the drum. Bob DeBoo on the bass. Zach Ridewine at the piano. My name is Victor Goins. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for supporting the club. Please come back, support Jazz St. Louis. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Tell all your servers how much you enjoyed them. They love to hear. We love to hear it as well. Take care. Good night. Let's keep things going for Zach Radwine, Bob DeBoo, Marty Morrison, and of course, Jazz St. Louis's own Victor Goins. Before you all head out tonight, I just want to say on behalf of Jazz St. Louis, thank you to our sponsors. And again,